Okay, so um, yeah, you saying if you want to do this as like a question answer thing, I'm, I'm not really sure. Like for the people we've got, are we interested in kind of talking about just generally how it works, or like uh, differences from you know the other stuff that's already out there that people have used, or or how we should approach this? Really, um, I'm not sure what the uh, best um, approach is because I mean the kind of the guide stuff is covers a lot of the kind of basics that that you know would be. Um, it kind of works through it with code samples and that kind of thing. And, and I spent quite a while working on that stuff. I mean, it's not fully done yet for the new version, but um, that'll cover the kind of like, you know, low level concepts and stuff like that. But I mean, if that's what we want to go through now as well, that's fine as well. Uh, concepts in terms of using, not, not in terms of implementation, which is probably not so interesting. I mean, generally. Yeah. If you could um, just start us off by showing um, us one of the examples, and point out what's different between this version of Halogen and the other one, just sort of like a quick sort of uh, five minute overview of what's changed from the very top level and then delve into the implementation details. Sure. Um, so in terms of um, the demos, they're all quite minimal because I've tried to kind of keep the, uh, the examples to a, like a very specific feature so they generally don't have a huge amount of um, like interesting things to look at <laughs> but I can explain at least what what's happening with them and um, kind of talk a bit about you know why they're interesting or whatever so the most basic example that I start with is just simply a button with it which has its own state and you can turn it on and off and it'll just change the label um, depending on that so it seemed like a good example because it basically from this we can kind of cover all of the basic concepts of, of what a component can do in the UI in Halogen. Um, some of the stuff is new to the to the to the new um, the new version of Halogen as well. So um, we follow a model similar to before, where basically components have like a private state value, which is used to render, you know, the HTML that they display. Um, when when the component is actually running uh, in the browser and then the for inputs you kind of have this uh, query algebra we call it which is um basically like a dsl which is all of the actions which uh the component can run and that's both uh, for actions that the component can raise on itself so like when you click the button it, it knows that it needs to toggle and do something but also in halogen you can um, run queries on the component externally um, that doesn't necessarily make sense unless you have already used it a bit, but basically it means that um, when we have a child component in, in a container, or if we have um, the top level sort of, of an app outside of the um, outside of the actual UI, we can send um, queries into the, into the component and kind of have things happen. So um, I'm seeing things in the chat here. But, oops. Um, Yeah, and uh, as Christoph is saying there, Halogen basically is the OO model, <laughs> but done with you know uh, a bit more principle, a bit more principle than it's the kind of the, the the basics of OO where it's about um, components can encapsulate encapsulate state, um, and they have a they communicate via messages essentially. Um, queries are these sort of input messages, and um, they also have now, which is one of the things which is um, new to the. So the next version of halogen is um, and they have output messages. So in the past, when you wanted to get some information out of a component, um, you could do it by observing. Well, actually, I'll, I won't get into that right now. I'll <laughs> I'll focus on a single component example, and then I'll talk about a bit about you know what this thing does. So um, this is all of the code that we have for our component for the actual uh, button that we were looking at in the browser a second ago, which is just that simple on off. Um, not very exciting, but you know, it illustrates the uh, the use case well enough of you know a component with state. So um, for the state of that, we just have a boolean because we only have two things that we want to track here, whether it's been enabled or not. And then we are going to define some actions that the button can cope with. So it can be toggled, which just flips the state from whatever it's on currently to its opposite. And then we have this also this slightly stranger looking constructor which allows us to check the current state of the button. Um, now, in a lot of the other kind of UI systems, uh, kind of that are more signal-based or kind of 
just generally out there, this idea of asking a component for information is probably a little uncommon. Um, usually it would sort of be able, you'd be able to observe that like flowing back up the, 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 through the stream or, you know, something like that. Whereas in Halogen, it's kind of a little bit more imperative in that um, you can kind of query, this is, the, the, this is why it is called a query basically, because you can get information out of a component as well as um, kind of running actions on it to update its current state. Um, and in addition to that, we have these messages, which is things that the component can emit that, um, that parents or kind of things outside of Halogen itself can listen to. So these are kind of like equivalent to events in JavaScript, more or less. Although they don't bubble, they're just sort of, um, you would have to explicitly bubble them if you wanted to kind of have that arrangement. They just allow a parent of a component to kind of observe what is happening within it. Um, so then we get to our actual component definition, which is just consists of these three bits. We have our initial state, because we need something to render when the component is uh, created. Uh, we have our render function, which takes a state value and then produces some HTML <coughs> based on the state. And then we have eval, which essentially is, uh, this is how we deal with the queries that come into a component. So this is kind of like, um, well, yeah, it evaluates queries and produces a result um, for them. So in the case we have here, um, toggle is, right, so actually I'll, Talk about something else to this um, component DSL that we are interpreting our queries into is um, it used to be this crazy free monad with like a horrendous type signature. I mean, there's still a few component uh, like bits going on here. Um, what's that, Christoph? <laughs> the kind being simpler or this kind being like still no, crazy? The kind of a component DSL still is kind of crazy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, th there is still a lot of stuff going on in here, but um, it gives us basically all of the capability. Th this is kind of like the, the core of what makes Halogen actually useful. So the fact that there's a few bits in there that are, <laughs> that are still um, fairly complex is kind of unavoidable. But um, on the whole, you know, this stuff is way simpler than it used to be. Um, and a big part of that is now that components don't reveal anything about any children they have. Whereas previously the types would get more and more complex because every time you added uh, like a child component to a parent, the kind of that type would have to appear in the parent's type as well. Whereas now you only ever have one level of the types that are actually exposed at any one time, which massively simplifies the, um, the type signatures and also improve, lets us do a few things that we couldn't do before. Like you can have co uh, components with recursive types. So you can have like a component with the same type of component inside itself. Whereas previously that would have, I mean, there were, there were hacks that would let you do it, but now um, we have a kind of much better way of talking about it because we don't have issues with having infinite types and things like that because it, all, all those details are, are obscured. Um, so this component DSL, there is a, a monad associated with this. It's still implemented as a free monad, but none of that stuff is exposed anymore. We actually have a real type for this, which means again, the error messages that you get are significantly less crazy than they used to be <laughs> because you used to have like this huge chain of co-products and all kinds of errors coming out of it. Whereas now the message will always be talking about um, halogen M. Uh, component DSL is actually a type synonym for another, um, another type. It's actually exactly, uh, well, there are still a few differences here. If you want to use a parent component, then this type, then you use a different synonym here, but they both use the same underlying type. Um, this component DSL basically just fills in some fields which aren't relevant when you have a when you have a component that doesn't have any children. Um, and then within this like eval, we we have uh, a bunch of actions that we can do. The most useful of which is obviously manipulating the state of the current component. Um, oh, let's see if that works. Uh, Yeah, afraid not, Christoph. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh, it might be. It's not. It's not. It's not only Christoph. <laughs> um, I'm in the. Uh, I'm in an example project here, so maybe it's because that definition is not actually present. Um, oh, we should, we should jump through through our components as well, but it could be an atom thing rather than a PSC ID. So you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, 
I actually can just load up that type instead and get it abstract. Um, Uh, okay, so this is the synonym that it's for. So we have some stuff here which is irrelevant in the case of a child component um, because this type here would be the query algebra for uh, child components and then this is the uh, like the type that we use for the slot address of a component. But I mean, I'll go into those details in a minute because unless you've already used halogen a bit, those concepts don't really mean much right now. Um, but this um, example I'm talking about here, so this uh, type, this halogen M type we have now used to have a lot of kind of custom actions that would sort of represent, uh, that were sort of replicating the interface for like the state monad and things like that. They, it now actually implements the, those classes properly. So although we're using um, these functions like h.get and h.put, which are qualified through a halogen, these are just re-exports of the normal state monad functions now. So we've kind of managed to clean up a lot of the stuff that was specialized for halogen previously, so that now we can use the normal abstractions that we have when we're dealing with um, like uh, monad transformer stacks, basically. Um, because that's, this is actually now a monad transformer, whereas previously it was kind of like this ad hoc thing that, that was sort of a transformer, but not really. Um, that is interesting because it means that we can use the capabilities of M within this eval, which I'll explain later on because we, we use that kind of thing when we want to actually have a component that can do something effectful when an interaction happens. So like if we want to load some data from, you know, using FJAX or some other library like that, um, we, can, we can plug that stuff in and then just use um, lift or lift F or, you know, these, these kind of like common functions that we would use anywhere else in a normal, um, normal piece of uh, pure script rather than the previous situation where we had it's all the same operations but they were kind of like halogen custom versions of them so um, basically we managed to like rationalize a lot of the stuff that was previously a bit more ad hoc so as for what's going on in here um, toggle is basically we just get the state of the component we flip the state to be the opposite of what it is um, and then we put it back then we have this raise action, and uh, this is how we make a component emit a message. So you can't emit any, like the actions that a component performs can only ever be done through eval. So it means like we can't put something in an on-click handler directly to say like raise a message when this happens so that the parent can hear about it. We would always have to ra like raise an event, um, raise a query here, which then comes back into the component and is then processed. So this kind of model of always sending things through a val um, is, is pretty much always been the case with halogen, but there's a few updates in here that means that it's much more consistent now about um, how we kind of process um, events and generally things that happen both in JavaScript um, in the HTML, but also when we start doing things with like third party components, like if we want to use the ace editor or things like that, which um, we kind of was a motivating thing for why we came up with halogen in the first place for um, the stuff we're doing with slam data. Like we wanted the ability to um, easily integrate non-halogen components into the UI. Um, and that is kind of something that is made very difficult when you don't have the sort of private state model that we have with the components in halogen. So that's a big part of kind of how we ended up at the design we've got now is that, you know, we, we have a, a set of a couple of components. I mean, we don't end up using it ex extensively in Slam data, but um, we have the ACE text editor and we use eCharts, which is uh, by Baidu, I think. And um, both of these kind of would not fit <laughs> too well in, in a kind of more real FRP model, if you like, because it's very difficult to sort of um, deal with the communication overhead that you have when you sort of have to push everything through the top level of the app and then kind of have it trickle down to the component because we did start off like the original implementation of halogen back when uh, phil did it was sort of signal based and um i mean it worked pretty well like the, we, we got the first version of slam data built on it but we encountered problems along the way integrating with these you know third party components as we call them and um sort of where we arrived at after that having private state and having the ability to query components was basically a, a means to um, 
give us a nice interface for dealing with that stuff. As it happens, for me at least, <laughs> it turns out to be a pretty natural way of building UIs anyway, because um, the kind of, I find personally the sort of object model is quite a nice way of thinking about a UI. Like, you know, the, an object in your app rep, it sort of maps to a physical thing, or not physical, but you know, a representation of something in the UI. So kind of having objects rather than streams of things, for me, I find quite a nice way of thinking about how the UI sort of is put together. Um, I mean, there are dis, you know, disadvantages to this approach as well. It's certainly not as like elegant from a kind of theoretical perspective, but um, you know, we, <laughs> we wanted to make things with this. So that was, that was you know, something we had to kind of give up on and, and kind of be a bit more pragmatic about how we wanted to sort of design the library. I mean, we still got plenty of other cool stuff in there from the <laughs> FB side of things, but um, you know, trying to make a, come up with a concept that was like, you know, all singing, all dancing and totally pure was not sort of something we were going to stick to if it got in the way of what we were trying to achieve here. So, um, one question, just, a, just an idea. Is it possible to have components that basically do no rendering? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, you can render basically uh, text with nothing in it, which equates to a text node in the DOM, but it means it basically renders as nothing at all. Because that doesn't sound like it's like the, the model is restricted to UIs only. It basically yeah, has nice right. components that encapsulate cast, like private state. Can that work for any other application as well, maybe? Yeah, and actually the way that, the, that we kind of design the components, they actually have this parameter now which determines what the render is expected to output. So in theory, we could rate, create just like a null renderer there, and then we could have components used for some other kind of representation of, you know, a network of communicating pieces or something like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. as Mike Fold is saying there, React Native is, is basically the motivation for that. We don't have an ability to do it yet, but um, we kept this parameter in here so that in theory we can create a, you know, a proper React Native version of Halogen as well without I having might, to throw away a lot of the other stuff that's in there. Um, yeah, right. Well, exactly. I might try to rewrite PSID to use this and render to the, the console. Yeah, Just yeah, that would work. Um, I mean, you'd have to probably come up with some new ideas about how we could get inputs in back in from the rendered output and things like that. But the, in principle, there's absolutely, you, you could definitely do something along those lines. Um, you know, that even though this is sort of designed to suit UIs, it, it could, in theory, work for you know anything where you have encapsulated objects that want to communicate. <laughs> so yeah, whatever you you've got, really. I'd be interested to see some people come up with stuff for that. Um, it's worth noting as well that you you can use like streams of things that un underlying this with the inputs um, from the HTML into the query um, sure. evaluator. Yeah. Like that's that's just a, a basically a, a coroutine of um, events coming in, of queries coming in, so you can get streams from anything, whether that's um, from you know streaming uh, terminal input or um, it's from like some data source or some sensor or whatever. As long as it can be streamed, it can be transferred into, transformed into a, the query and then evaluated by the component. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in Slab Data, as Becky's talking about there, we, we do a lot of stuff with streams that aren't necessarily originating data from um, the UI. And, uh, you know, the, the halogen model is not necessarily, uh, like, unusable with streams and that kind of thing. It's just that of all the abstractions that we provide as part of the library for building UI, streams are never revealed as, like, a, as a core thing, um, unlike something like Cycle.js, where, you know, streams are everything. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use them. It just means it's not sort of the um, the, the the kind of uh, like the fundamental thing that they're based on, or kind of um, you know, kind of it's not the abstraction that they ha lean on most heavily. Um, mm -hmm. The abstraction they lean on. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it is really. It is. <laughs> it's kind of you know whatever. It, the plumbing is all hidden, so the that that sort of thing isn't revealed. But. The ability, the ability is there to sort of interact with streams and whatnot. Um, it's much more like sort of um, like a server before Web 2.0 um, when you sort of had an HTTP request come in and then you'd render a new HTML page and then you'd send it up. 
that's sort of the abstraction apart from instead of um, HTTP requests, you have these queries. Um, and, and additionally as well, just like in response to some of the things that people have been saying, like um, I'm sure that components could be used for like loads of really cool stuff, but like, um, like Halogen doesn't say, hey, you should use a component for everything. Like um, there's, um, w w even for rendering HTML, quite often it makes more sense just to use a function from something to HTML than a component. Um, and um, we've actually moved um, recently a lot of um, the sort of model and the, um, the loading, et cetera, of um, a big part of our application that we have at some data. Um, out of halogen components into their own separate um, sort of abstraction and then just render that using halogen components. So um, don't get the idea that it's like components all the way down or that you have to use components for everything. Then great when you have to encapsulate state and present a user interface, but when you're not doing that, um, halogen's perfectly content for you to do it any other way. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, there is actually some benefit now to using components more so than there was before because um, of how components are actually dealt with when they're run, which I'll explain in a bit. But, um, you know, having a component for an individual button like we have in this example here, in the real world, you probably wouldn't do this. You would actually just integrate this state into part of a bigger component, only so you wouldn't have to define like a whole class and, you know, uh, like a whole uh, module and all this stuff that you would need just for the sake of a single button. Like there's no problem just sort of, you know, having using this within HTML as you want. So it really splitting components, uh, at what level you split a component is kind of, it, it, it's something you get a feel for as you work with um, this stuff. Essentially, when you find that, oh, this component's getting pretty complicated, at that point, you would probably break some part out of it into a subcomponent. But I guess it's the same as kind of like, um, <laughs> halogen by example. Yeah, well, hopefully the, um, the guide is going to include a lot of stuff with proper like examples that are somewhat useful. So I'm hoping that um, the new new version of the guide will cover a lot of the um, the kind of use cases that are most talked about or sort of need figuring out. So um, and the guide's available with from a fifty pound a month subscription. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it takes me long enough to write, so I should probably charge for it. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and yes, try halogens. Okay, that's another good point. We'll get that set up as soon as this version is released. The version I'm using right now um, is using a virtual DOM as its kind of uh, driver for when we actually render stuff. So when you when you run a, 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 a component at the top level to actually produce a UI in the browser, you you pass it off to something that we call the driver. And uh, the version that we have here is using something that is using the actual JavaScript virtual DOM library. But we're like so close to having a version that works, which is based on um, a pure, pure script implementation of a virtual DOM uh, algorithm. It almost totally works. <laughs> but this is just like, there's two little case things that meant that, that it hasn't, uh, that we're not using it just yet. But um, that is actually the thing which is holding up the release at the moment. Um, originally, we, I wasn't even going to attempt to do this before for the new, new release, but um, it's going to be happening hopefully in the next few days. Nathan is working on a fix for the last remaining bug, hopefully at the moment. So we'll, uh, that'll be nice because it means we no longer will have any npm dependencies for this project either. It will just run as is. And um, from the work Nathan's been doing, benchmarking it, it's fairly um, competitive in terms of speed, even though it's written in pure script. There is some JavaScript in there, obviously, because we need to you know, use the FFI to actually do things in DOM, but um, the rest of it is written in some slightly unconventional PR script code because it's using uh, like the, the function four, function five, kind of higher arity uh, functions. So the code isn't super nice, but at least it's all PR script, so it's typed and you know has everything going for it like that. And, and on a benchmark as well, it's actually faster than React. Yeah. Um, that's but, just when using the driver directly. Probably exactly. Yeah. As well. It'll be, I would hope, maybe re react fast. But um, there is something about that I mentioned, like with the components that I'll get into in a bit, that means that we might actually have some advantages over all of the other virtual DOM systems. But um, and yeah, as Whitefield asking about there, uh, what about a driver for React? I did some experiments with one, and at the time. I had no idea how React worked, <laughs> so I didn't get very far with that. But um, since then, I kind of 
educated myself a bit and experimented with them just just using React and JavaScript. So there's a possibility we'll do one of those um, for people who want to use it. Um, but I'm not super interested in maintaining one long term. So I'll probably throw that project into like PureScript Contrib or something. And then if people want to keep using that, then we can do it that way instead. Because um, it's kind of like, you know, we don't want to throw a bunch of drivers in and only really worry about how well one of them works. We would like, you know, to properly support the stuff that we that we have as part of the project. So um, likewise, a virtual DOM driver, I'll probably spin that off into a separate project as well once um, once we have the kind of pure, pure script version working. Um, we'll support them both for a while at least because um, the real test for this for us will be when we switch over slam data to use every, all the new stuff and um, that is going to be probably happening in January or February. <laughs> Unfortunately it's, there's a bit of a ramp up because um, we've got a release to get out um, and the we have like a, a huge number of components that we'll need converting over to the new style. Um, so we just need to find some time to kind of make that happen. But um, if it turns out that, for instance, we find some more bugs in the new Helogen V DOM renderer, that'll mean that at least the virtual DOM one will still work um, as it does. And yes, as people are saying here, that is exactly why I would like to have a React driver, because it would definitely be um, like a potentially a kind of good point to sort of interface with React components both ways. Um, so you could embed Halogen app as a React component and you could use React components as Halogen components. So we'll see how that goes though. So, um, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> it might be, it might convince a few more people to move over to Halogen. Like if you want to steal some more people <laughs> um, from, you know, these, because I mean, I understand that Halogen at the moment is, is kind of intimidating, like the current version because of the types and everything. But um, that's part of a, a lot of what has kind of motivated this, this release is trying to simplify a lot of things, both to make it more usable, but also since we can do these things now to make it more friendly, um, adding things like React support would definitely probably make it more uh, appealing to the wider world. Um, but yeah, a bit of a digression there. So this book component example isn't very exciting because we only have one component, so we can't actually see this button doing anything. So it might be emitting messages when we toggle it and stuff like that, but there's no like real way for us to observe that at the moment because uh, you know this is just a, a single component on its own doing nothing on the screen. So um, if I will dig out one of the other examples which actually illustrates uh, components being used. If this is the part of the guide that I've not really got like finished with yet, so um, this might take me uh, a minute to find something that works. Or if I can't find anything, then I can write something like just live code it anyway. So, um, any questions so far? Um, I mean, I know this is a bit rambling, so apologies, but probably should have done a proper outline for what I was about to do. But <laughs> Looking at some of our oh, okay. Well, I can show you the ACE example. Um, that's um, I'll come back to that in a sec because that kind of involves getting into parent components a bit as well, which um, isn't that complicated. But I'll just. Uh, give this demonstration first. Um, okay, so this is a stupid example, but again, I'm trying to make each of the examples sort of build on the previous ones. So I didn't want to, I'm trying to make them sort of pretty dumb in what they're doing because I'm trying to, as much as possible, focus on just like changing code in, in a minimal way to sort of introduce a new concepts. So we have our button now, but it's embedded in another component um, around it. Um, and we can see that when we toggle it, the uh, parent component is noticing the fact and tracking what, you know, basically just counting how many times it was clicked. Um, so what does that look like? So the button component we have is exactly the same as it was before and our container now um, has its own query algebra um, because it needs, has its own set of actions that need to be handled. And the actions that we've got are check button state which equates to what happens when you click this button and then handle button, 
So this is what we want to do when a message comes out of the button itself. Um, it has its own state, which we track the clicks, and then we track the state of the button that, that there's been embedded within it. And then, uh, you know, we render our HTML and so forth. So this thing here, this slot, is how we actually embed a child component in a parent. And um, what we have here is basically, the, what the value that goes in here is, um, is well, <laughs> we have a bit of a terminology thing here where we, no one's really figured out exactly what to call these things yet, but sometimes this is called the slot, but it, it's like the, the, the address for the slot rather than the slot itself. So even though I've defined this data and called it slot up here, what it's for is like a placeholder for where we want to install our child component. And um, we only have one child component here. So the constructor is just, a, you know, a single constructor with, you know, no inputs or anything like that. We can use any type for these um, as long as it has an odd instance. So we could actually just make this a string. We could use unit. We could use anything for, that is, you know, usable for odd. Um, and the reason we need that is because if we want to send a query to a child component, we need some way to refer to it. And um, there isn't a way that we can sort of construct it beforehand and then ask about it later. So we kind of have this sort of addressing system when you actually query it. Um, so if you had a component for each like contact in a list, then and they were all the same type of component, then you would like have like a ID for them or whatever, and that would let you talk to a specific one to update, say like message counts or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So quite often when you have a, a real example, like when you have a list of things or whatever, the type you would use here would be like the ID for the things in the in the data, the, the IDs for the data in the list or just a new type around a, a counter or something like that. But it, because this example is super simple, we only have you know one slot that we actually use. It's just this button type. Um, the second argument we have here is a constructor for the child component. Um, now this is something that is always confusing and unfortunately I've not really thought, found a good way to explain, you know, to make this clear, but this is um, the defer thing you see here is part of uh, lazy. Uh, see here. And the reason it's lazy is essentially we only construct the button the first time this, this slot appears in the HTML. So the reason that's confusing is um, quite often people will be tempted to pass values through to the button, like as part of some kind of state value from the parent. Something like you would have, um, if we were using React, this would be like props, basically. You know, you would pass some value through from the parent to say like, you know, to have the button do. But this function is only actually ever run once. So this is like basically always should be something along these lines. It's just the deferred thing of the constructor. We don't actually want to do any like passing of values through here unless you know what you're doing, <laughs> which is of course not the great sign of a not the sign of a great design, but um, there are cases where it is still useful to pass some kind of static data through to a component. But you just have to bear in mind that if you change that value, it will never actually update in the child component unless the child component is reconstructed. But um, anyway, we're not doing anything here. We're just passing the constructor, uh, or sorry, the, the definition of the, the child component here. So that was um, the actual disk that we defined in the, in the other file. Um, and then we have here, um, basically the message handler for the child component. So this is like subscribing an event listener or something like that. Um, and what we're saying is we want to raise the handle button query on this component when the child emits the message. Um, and then you can see it's handled down here. Um, so this is the message type that we defined for the button in the other file. Um, and then we do something with it in here when it's done. So in this case, we just toggle the counter to say where we noticed that it was clicked. And that's a big change between the previous version of Halogen and this one. In the previous version, you so, didn't have this message type for components, and instead, um, parent components would uh, be able to peek on the queries that were happening in their children, um, which um, meant that you had this sort of long chain, like Gary was talking about earlier with co-products and things like that, of um, all the components and their query types and etc um, and this makes it a lot simpler by simply allowing you to handle um, a message uh, messages that the uh, child component um, 
um, wants to expo uh, expose to the world as opposed to anything that the child component is doing internally with its um, evaluation. And uh, that's also useful because previously basically the input queries and the output messages were mashed into one type because everything would have to appear in query. So if you wanted to have it toggled, you would usually, you would have to have something in here and then just have the eval do nothing for the things that were events. And there was no way from the outside of telling whether you were supposed to be observing something as a parent component or not. Whereas now it's made explicit. Basically anything that's in query uh, algebra for a type is an input and anything that's a message is kind of like an output for that thing. Um, so having that separation is much cleaner than it used to be. And um, it's also part of the change in the design. Like we, we have no way of observing the queries going on within child components anymore, um, which is you know part of the type simplification that's you know happened here. Um, so the way the the um, component, the button component, was set up is when you toggle it, it does actually emit um, a value saying whether it's now enabled or not. But I've just ignored that in this example because it lets us use the query system to sort of illustrate the fact that, so this state thing, when we click it, asks the child whether it's on or off. It doesn't update like when we change the child, it's only updated when we, when we make the request to the child. Um, so this is the kind of, you know, the, the, this is essentially why it's useful for third party components. In a system like um, a sort of more FRP or signal based system, the problem is you would have to keep track of everything that happened within a child and somehow store that in the component that you've made in Halogen. Whereas because we have a query algebra and sort of an interface to the thing, we can, we can check the actual JavaScript um, component or the React component or whatever it is that we've embedded to get the information out and on request, which means essentially we don't have to copy the entire state of a child when we embed it, when it's um, you know, for a third party component like the ACE editor or something. Because it, for the example of ACE, you would have to track all kinds of stuff like the cursor position, you know, the, the text that is currently entered, all this stuff. And every time it changed, you would have to kind of pull that information into Halogen and store it in the state. Now we don't have to do any of that because we can just ask the actual ACE component, you know, where is this happening? It means you can't communicate this stuff with messages. You would have to still do that work that way, but it's useful, uh, but it lets you actually to have the distinction to be able to say, like, at this point in time, what is this component doing? However, um, that is also a drawback. <laughs> mm. Because obviously it means that if you don't check what a child is doing, your parent might not be observing the state correctly for the child. So this is both, you know, it's powerful, but it comes with a cost of possibly making it more error prone if you're like doing certain things with it. You want to say something back? Uh, yeah, it's just that as well as um, as well as sort of making it um, reducing the amount of copied state or having some sort of horrific global state um, you uh, that you're passing through the stream over and over and over again. It also means that it just plays far more nicely with um, uh, any existing JavaScript libraries um, because, uh, for example, Ace component it doesn't work like a text area, like it has its own kind of like, um, it, you might expect an on-click to work in a certain way and it won't. Or um, the sort of messages that it exposes aren't, um, don't fit very nicely into streams and aren't very nicely recomposed back into streams. So by putting it into a component and, uh, and um, uh, being able to query its values when you need them, um, you um, have this amazing ability to um, use very disciplined um, uh, kind of declarative way of building applications, but still be able to pull any JavaScript library off the shelf and use it rather than having to write everything from scratch, even for a, point, uh, a proof of concept. Yeah, still a bit amount of work needs to do now so you've got the FFI stuff to deal with. But you can very quickly get stuff working. Like our, the ACE example I'm about to show you has a very minimal interface to actually, you know, explaining, like doing things with ACE, but the power is there that you, so that you can use basically any of ACE's um, API if, if we did some more work to kind of expose more of it. Um, so this is, Alex was asking a minute ago about whether we, uh, or how we, how we do the kind of, uh, what a third party component looks like. So, we define a component like that's basically um, a wrapper for whatever we want our child component to do for this ACE example. Um, 
what that usually means is you end up with a, a render that looks pretty stupid because you all you need is an empty div. You need something to target your third party component to be rendered within. So this is where it's kind of a little bit tricky because like we're essentially handing off the, the DOM underneath this div to some other to be patched. Um, so this is something that happens like this would sort of be risky if it wasn't designed the way it is <laughs> in that you could have the DOM re-render it and it would just disappear the, the, the component that we've attached to this div. But um, because we're using, you know, diffing and so forth, it only pays attention to this parent. And as long as we don't change anything about this parent, hence the const, it means it won't be patched. And therefore, once we've made this div, it basically is permanently using the same div forever, which means we can freely attach our third party component underneath it and then start dealing with it that way. So the ACE example that we have here is pretty basic. We've got the editor embedded, you know, you can see it's got some stuff, you know, we've got, it's not applying any of the, um, like the, the text editor mode or anything, but we have the ability to observe changes within it. Um, and it comes, those come out as messages and we can also send a clear in which clears the editor. So this is communicating, you know, directly through, um, so our main component, sorry, I'll go back a sec. The main component has the button which does the clearing in and it has the text area itself. And then we embed our ACE component in there. Um, so this is always a bit ugly. I mean, but it's basically unavoidable that, you know, like it, 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 it's, um, we're essentially making an interface between the FFI library and Halogen. So there's a bit of sort of stuff in here, which is unusual for, you wouldn't really have to write this too often because it's obviously as much as possible, you wouldn't want to be relying on these, but because the need arises, then at least it's possible is, you know, what I'm getting at basically. So um, as usual, we have a state that we want to define for this stuff. So we want to, we, want, we need to get hold of the element that we actually want to display our editor within. And um, the, there is a ref property you can use in HTML, which, uh, when this div is rendered, the ref um, will raise this input in the eval for the component. So basically, um, like this set element that we've got here, we can just have an eval for it where we store the element in the state. Um, this can I is, ask a brief question actually? Yeah. Is, does ref now happen on rendering as opposed to when it is created um, as an element inside of JavaScript? Um, the distinction is slightly different. It depends on which renderer you're using. Um, so when you're using virtual DOM, this ref thing happens um, as soon as the element is actually created. So it hasn't even been attached to the page yet at this point. So essentially, you should never use a ref to do like anything really, apart from storing stuff in the state so that you can then use it later on. That's still a guarantee that I would recommend relying on that ref is basically only ever supposed to be used to capture an element not to actually do something but that's only because it's a bit unpredictable about when exactly it happens during the render life cycle so if you for instance try to do something in here like get the size of the element that we just rendered it's going to be nothing because it hasn't been attached to the page um as it happens i think in the new vdom stuff that's Nathan's been working on, I think it happens after the element has actually been added to the page, but that's why I'm saying that I would just stick to the idea that a ref is just there to capture an element, um, pretty much. Um, then we have a set of queries that we want to do this. So set element is what we use for capturing it. Initialize and finalize are two things we've not talked about yet, but um, when you set up a component, you can set it up so that when the component is created and removed, it also evals a query on itself um, immediately, basically. So this is useful for the ACE query because, sorry, the ACE um, editor, because once we've captured the HTML element that has been rendered in the div, the initialize then happens once the rest of the component is finished initializing and we can actually insert our editor and do you know the stuff that needs to be done to set the ACE editor up, which is what we have going on here. So, by the time initial, so initialize happens after the refs, which is always a, a bit of the thing about why refs are kind of weird. They happen so early on that the component isn't really ready. Um, whereas initialize is the first point at which a component should sort of be doing something. Um, 
So we can get our element that we stored from the ref. There's a chance it doesn't exist, so that's why we have a case uh, thing here. Um, we then just initialize the ace editor in F because like the stuff, the work that we're doing in here is, um, what's that? <laughs> what cat? That's, never mind. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, yeah, the, the stuff we've going on here, this lift F is, um, us using the mono transformery part of the um, uh, of the sort of uh, query processor, um, and that is allowing us to sort of use AF that we have in here. So we're saying essentially, when we run this component, we have to have AF as the um, sort of basis for how this thing is working. This is pretty common. Like AF isn't the only thing you can use here, but it's like the default. If you don't have anything else that you would be doing with it. You can either leave it entirely unspecified, like we had in the button example, because there's no effects that need to be dealt with. But if you have something which is doing effects, then it's probably going to be F other than that. Um, the guide goes into the reasoning a bit more about that. I wouldn't talk about it too much right now, but um, because it is kind of like, it, it doesn't matter for most, <laughs> most of the time. Um, but we have, what we have going on here is we're calling some stuff in ACE, which is uh, like the this is stuff that maps to f of i functions essentially where we just need to feed it an element to use. Um, then we initialize the editor session and we store this stuff back in the state. And then we set up a, a subscription to an event source, which is a, this is where streams sort of start becoming a, a concept that are used in Halogen, but it's not in the sense where you kind of choose how to wire them up. When you subscribe to a, an event source, what it expects is um, it will raise queries back on in eval again. So this isn't like an arbitrary stream that can be plumbed wherever you want. It's pretty much explicitly for um, creating a, a source of queries that other component will deal with. So uh, we are, so there's two, there's a couple of helper functions for creating event sources. And the one we have here is basically a, um, an event source where we want to raise a query anytime uh, some function is called, but we don't care about the actual, any arguments this function will accept. So um, that's what the underscore part means. Basically we're ignoring the argument. If you have, there's also an event source where we want to do something with an argument each time. But again, this is the kind of stuff that's probably better to read into documentation and see an example of. The, gen, the concept here basically is we want to raise a handle change query anytime we get a uh, this kind of session to unchange event listener is raised within um, the ace editor itself. Um, so then we have to grab the editor back out of our state again because we've you know we're in a new context here. Unfortunately, because that might not have initialized yet, although it should have done if the component's been set up correctly, it means that you know we have a maybe in here. But um, what we can do then is we can just sort of call uh, a function on the editor again and get our value back. Uh, and then we can raise like the message from the component so that we can observe it in the parent. Um, this thing we have here is kind of a thing which is special to um, uh, queries which are meant for dealing with uh, subscriptions. So this was something that uh, Rightfall discovered after we sort of changed it a bit. There used to be like a boolean here, which was just like true or false. And it kind of didn't, <laughs> it was a bit uh, opaque as to what it actually meant. But essentially you have the option of unsubscribing um, when this is called each time. So when you do this like reply thing here, you can either say listen, listening or stop, which basically means you have an option, uh, have an easy way of unsubscribing from event listeners. And that was something that was previously impossible for Halogen. Basically once you started an event source, you can never end it. You, you just had to, you know, um, it just basically would just keep listening forever or maybe get garbage collected eventually if you, you know, disconnected everything that was to do with the component. So this is quite useful that now we can actually have a, a real way of handling subscriptions that previously was sort of something we hadn't really figured out how to do. Um, then we have, you know, just like stuff in here so we can change the text to the editor and whatnot. But you can see we're not, we're doing quite a lot of stuff in Halogen still. We're just relying on sort of the F functions that the uh, ACE library exposes to us to deal with all this stuff. 
So um, this is kind of an example, I guess, a little bit like Christoph was saying, in that we're not really rendering much here of interest because all of the stuff that's happening is dealt with within the, um, the actual sort of third party component itself. And we're essentially just writing an interface in our eval to so sort of translate between the, the component query algebra language and the actual ACE editor API. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not very pretty, but it, it, the fact that we can do it is super useful. <laughs> mm. and, and ACE is a complicated example as well. There's sort of quite a few things you have to do with it. And, and it, I, 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 something I really like about it is that the difference between this and um, a component that is just using, uh, for example, HTTP requests or um, uh, the camera interface from, or, uh, or the photos interface from your phone or your laptop um, is very minimal. Like they basically work the same way. Um, the only difference is that this is basically just rendering a div, um, which we have a reference to, which we then use in that code, as opposed to using, um, for example, a URL for an HTTP resource. So it sort of um, is quite unopinionated in that way. It's not like, oh, there's a widget component that has to work like this. It's just the same component as anything else it just happens to be using these side effects and, um, and uh, applying the um, reference to the uh, DOM node um, to some of them, when it is, I think, really quite pretty. Yeah. Um, and I probably should have started with just a simpler example of using something effectful in the actual component eval before we jump in onto ACE. But um, so as an example of that now, we have this little component where we can look up something from the GitHub API and it will just give us, you know, whatever um, response that comes back from here. Um, so to actually make this possible, we have a bit of a more complicated render than the other examples, but it's you know, so I'll just HTML stuff. Um, and then in our eval, we are relying on, again, this is the, I think I was talking about before, where because a component DSL is a monad transformer and also implements monad f and monad f and all these other kind of uh, instances, which are pretty, have a lot of interesting use cases now, um, we can just do a lift f and call, um, like this is using fjax to actually get the thing here. And, um, you know, we, we just say, we need to, cover that in the, the, the monad that the component is based on. But um, other than that, we basically need to make no changes to say that, you know, to have this, you know, deal with external effects. And um, because we're in AF, when we do something like this, we can just modify the state before and after actually making our request and it'll happen asynchronously. So we don't have to do something where we hook up a thing to say like when the result comes back, then we process some other requests and so forth. We just literally list the steps one after another and then we can have our UI, you know, flip its loading state on and off just based on, um, uh, you know, you, I mean, it was pretty quick there, but it's nice that you don't actually have to deal with kind of like, you know, the equivalent of callbacks in JavaScript or any kind of other thing. Um, the sort of downside of that is it means that you can actually have, um, not exactly race conditions, but you, <laughs> you could have two requests triggered at once and then they will, they will their, their, their like behavior will interleave. So this is one of the cases again, where we've sort of said like, yeah, it can happen, but it's the kind of thing like, you know, that actually is sometimes useful as well. So it's one of those things again, where it's, it's powerful, but at the cost of possibly making things more error prone occasionally. Um, so, you know, there are ways of, you know, dealing with that stuff, but, um, it's on the whole, it's super handy to be able to just sort of say, do this, do this other thing and wait for it to return, then, you know, do something else with the state and have it just kind of read as like a really nice one after the other comprehensible thing of like, you know, list of steps essentially. One question. Um, could you, if you did, like, if you didn't want the interleaving, could you do something like put the canceller into the, the component state? And yeah. then have the next request use that canceller to cancel the one before and then yeah yeah that's exactly what i meant when i said you there are ways around it but you just have to do a little bit of work so in this case yeah as christoph was saying when you make the request you would store the cancel the af can well you would fork it and you would store the canceller that is returned by forking the thing to to then you would uh, and then if you make another request you would cancel any existing 
thing that was in the state. So um, there's there are ways of handling all this this kind of thing. Um, I should probably make an example for that actually. That's a good point. Yeah, don't mind. <laughs> um, yeah. Because that's one of the things that promises can't do, right? The cancelling. They don't really have cancelling or something like that. They I have cancelling, but it's the semantics of it are so complicated. No one really understands what it means when you cancel something. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, like it, when you cancel stuff in AF, at least it has a sort of well-defined behavior of what that's supposed to be. Um, I mean, it still probably can get quite involved if you have chains of things that are, you know need cancelling, but um, essentially, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. If you cancel a request, then it will also cancel the AJAX request and anything else that's sort of um, was depended on within there. So it means, yeah, you can safely have a, have a canceller in here. Um, so that probably, I mean, this has been pretty all over the place, so, but I've probably covered a lot of the sort of major features of how this stuff works. Um, going back to the thing about one of the differences between the new and old halogen is now, when you actually have a component definition, so here we are oh, probably, Actually, I'll switch back to the components example. Um, when you have a parent component like this one, which is the container that we had our button within, the types now we have in here are only referring to the actual container itself. So we're talking about our the, the container query algebra and void because we have no messages for this one because we don't want to we don't have anything else to omit um this this is a, basically this one little change is the thing that is has ended up in most of the real architecture that that halogen now has which is by the fact that we need to we that we hide the state of child components because previously um the component type signature was like uh if i remember this now the component then you had the state of the parent and the state of the child then the the query algebra of the parent and the query algebra of the child. <laughs> then you had the monad, which is at the end, and then you had P, which was the slot addressing. So basically every component had all this stuff. And then every child also had all of the same, that all of the information repeated for its children and so forth, which is why you would end up with these insane type signatures. I mean, generally they were manageable by using synonyms, but when they came back with errors in the compiler, you would get this like unbelievably long error message with you know, rows in it and all kinds of stuff. And it just, I mean, you get used to it in the end, <laughs> but it was not a great situation. Whereas at least now we are much more, more you know, refined in what we're talking about when we embed a component. The render and eval uh, type synonyms get a bit more involved because they need to know a bit of information about what the child component is doing. Um, but they're significantly, uh, you know, because this stuff is only exposed within a, a component definition itself, it means that the, the complexity is, you know, much less. And the fact that like the button dot query we use here is just talking about just the query algebra of the button, not any potential children, you know, child query algebras that that button might have as well it means that, um, the, the generally the kind of typing setup is significantly, uh, less crazy than, <laughs> than we used to have. Um, so parent HTML is another, uh, uh I reckon that this works, so I'll try it now. Uh, hey, you're right, it does work if you do it that way. So, um, the HTML that we, value that we render here, there are two slightly different uh, things on this. So, the, mainly when we have this, there's the component DSL, component HTML, and parent HTML and parent DSL. And they're basically just there for convenience so that they have like a, a, a kind of, when you're writing a component with no children, you use the component ones. And when you have a parent component, which may have children, you use the parent ones. There's a, they, they refer to the same types, but we just have uh, synonyms that kind of fill in some of the stuff which is less relevant in the, these examples. If you want, you can use the low level ones, but um, it's probably more readable to use the, these and kind of, you know, just know that under the hood that they're, they're referring to the same thing just with a, a sort of a bit of uh, information obscured for convenience's sake. Um, so the parent DSL is actually exactly halogen M. Um, I think I scrolled past that earlier, but um, so it's basically just there for symmetry. It doesn't, you know, we could use halogen M directly when we have a parent component, but um, yeah. The type is a bit 
more involved again when you have a parent. But again, this is why we provide a synonym for it because a lot of this stuff is not that interesting and you know, there's some weird stuff going on here. But the idea is as much as possible, we try to keep the actual definitions of things in halogen to be as flexible as they can be. So that comes with the price of lots of type variables or uh, you know, other possible weird things going on. Um, but it's also incredibly like unopinionated, which exactly this is why we could have a component for say PSC ID or you know something other than uh, you know basically we're not rendering to HTML is because we have like you know this H parameter is everywhere you know we we try to avoid specialization in most places the parent HTML and component HTML examples are also filling in HTML here actually so if you were using a component which um, did have some kind of custom rendering setup, you wouldn't be using HTML in there. You would actually have to define your own one of these. But that would be the case anyway, because you wouldn't be rendering HTML. <laughs> You'd be rendering, you know, whatever makes sense for your particular custom style of component. Um, so like if we were doing the React data driver, your components would be using different synonyms for their render output, basically. But they would still be using the same DSL functions because they don't have any information about um, the kind of render output. Uh, purely to do with what we do when we do <coughs> eval um, for a component. Um, so, oh yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the instances that we can provide with Halogen M, which is kind of interesting, but maybe a bit meaningless if people haven't actually dealt with this stuff before. But I may as well um, talk about it because it can explain some of the interesting things that we can do now that were previously impossible. So, uh, so this is, this halogen F type was part of the stuff that was exposed previously, which is now hidden because we have a new type around a free monad is, our, is what halogen actually, halogen M actually is. Whereas previously this stuff was all exposed. Um, again, with the crazy kinds, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so, the instances that we provide for halogen M, are, we have the usual stuff you would expect because we are, it's a monadic DSL, so you have everything up to monad, you know, functor, apply, applicative bind, blah, blah, blah. Then we have uh, monad F and monad F. So you can use lift F and lift F as long as the M part of your halogen M is also monad F or monad F. Um, Oh, question for Alex, can you have separate queries available to external and internal to the component? Um, so you mean like if you had a button, you would want it to raise like an internal query, but then you, you could have an interface, which is things that it's only expecting from a parent or outside of the thing. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, I've thought about this. There isn't like a way in the way Halogen's set up right now but you can do it because you can because we can just make part of the. Um, you would probably want to use a co-product and then existentially hide one side of the co-product. So it is possible, but it's not something that we provide like a um, a, a constructor for from Halogen itself. Um, I might, that's probably another thing I wanted to sort of I wanted to figure out myself and then possibly include it as an example of you know how you can do it because I agree it would be nice to be able to sort of separate the concerns of things that are truly internal to the component and then things which are allowed to be passed in from the outside. Um, yeah. At the moment, yeah, the, the, there is no distinction between internal and external in that regard. Yeah, actually, you could do it with um, just wrapping a parent component around a child um, and then have the parent component pass on like a subset of the queries or something like that. You know, there, there are a few ways of doing it now because we have the, the mechanism where the, the details of a child is hidden by its parent. But then you have a bit of overhead in that, um, you know, every component has to go through, every query or message goes through two components on the way up or down. But, you know, there's, there's ways of doing it now, at least. Um, one question with regards to overhead. Uh, have you seen any slowdown on slam data because you're using all these tech classes now, or is that quite possible? Um, we haven't used this yet, so I can't oh. say. <laughs> and uh, the way we were doing it in slam data currently, I would say we would still have the same overhead because we were using classes still, but just we would had our own custom versions of them all. So instead of using monad f, we had 
uh, or sorry, in modded af, we had affable, which had the same exact operation, which was from af instead of left af though. So the, they should be basically the same in terms of the actual, you know, overhead of using the monadic DSL. Um, and everything's only being lifted one step or two in, into this anyway, because halogen M, the actual monad itself, uh, is one is flattened into one sort of set of possibilities that halogen uh, will process. Whereas actually previously we had um, state was sort of handled independently. So in some ways it should be faster, but yeah, we haven't benchmarked it yet. I was just wondering, um, do you have any theories about like how difficult it would be to turn a char component into a parent component um, and vice versa? Because at the moment, um, that's it's not that it's like difficult, but it's sort of difficult for you. For, for, it can be difficult in your head and take, take a little bit longer than expected to do that. So if you have um, uh, something that you're using throughout your application, and then you end up adding, being like, oh, I can use a third party component or I can split this off into two or three components or whatever, or I want to extract this functionality and use it in multiple places. Do you think that it's going to be easier now to um, change from a component to a parent component? Yeah, significantly easier because none of those details are exposed in the components um, type signature. Anything that happens with children inside it are, are completely opaque. Uh, in the type signature. So it means now you can just, uh, something that was apparent previously, it's kind of, oh, sorry, something that was a child previously, it's quite an operation to change it all, all of its types and everything to be apparent. But now you, it, there's no way of knowing whether a component is a child or a parent from the outside. So it means that, yeah, doing those kind of refactorings is like just totally trivial now, which is, awesome. I'm super looking forward to it. If you think it was needed, I mean, it was a crazy example, but. It was something that's used throughout the entire of some data and uh, is an extreme to actually extract a child out of uh, something that would now be totally easy. Um, uh, so just going back to these instances again a sec. Uh, so yeah, as well as monad f and monad f, we have a few new things that we can do within halogen m now that previously wasn't possible. One of which is we can do parallel things. Um, this is again where you can sort of get into trouble and shoot your own leg off um, <laughs> because uh, you can end up with doing things in a state that happen in parallel and such like. But it gives you some really nice options for sort of dealing with, um, like you can query a bunch of children in parallel now, whereas previously that would be impossible, which would mean that you have to wait for the, each child to reply before processing the next. Um, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's like an advanced feature again, but it gives us some really nice uh, possibilities for things that would previously have been very difficult to deal with. Um, and forking is similar to that. Um, you can, you know, whilst you're in an, in, in an eval, you can fork off the remainder of what is happening within a do block. And um, this is how that um, canceling would be made possible that Christoph was talking about when you actually make a request. So because you can fork something, it means that you can uh, then later have a canceler for it. And again, these things were sort of possible before, but only through things that were happening in the M part of a, of a algebra. So basically, you can only do it with F stuff, whereas now you can do it in the actual query algebra of the component. So it's a bit hard to visualize that, but basically it's exciting for us <laughs> in Slam Data because we have a couple of situations where we currently have to jump through hoops to make some of this stuff work, whereas now it can be done uh, pretty trivially. Um, another one is Mono Trans. Previously in Halogen, if you wanted to lift something into your M and it wasn't uh, an F or an F, which um, is kind of, again, another advanced use case, but you would have to use this lift H function, um, which was sort of a custom Halogen thing that, that was lift. But again, it was because we were in a free monad rather than um, an actual, like, real uh, new typed version of a monad like we have now. So it means you can basically use a proper transformer stack for your M if you want to, and lift will work, you know, the way it's supposed to, and just do, you know, lift straight up as many times as it needs to, to kind of get you uh, your, um, you know, transformer behavior. Um, I'm under state, so this is how we actually do the state updates for a component. And then also we have ask and tell, which are essentially they're reader and writer, but they're kind of subsets of reader and writer because they restrict a little bit what you can do but it, they're just kind of like we could, I think it, 
it is possible to implement reader but it's really ugly and realistically most people don't use it but what this means you can do is um, instead of using f as your m you can have a, a, a transformer stack where you have um, a reader that you can then use to sort of uh, spread global uh, variables throughout your app so if you've got some kind of global configuration you can add that in there and then you can it means that you can you know add uh, you can use the normal reader stuff within in your kind of eval to kind of fetch that information um, and likewise with writer you could use it for logging or whatever you know you could use it for analytic tracking perhaps something like that there's quite a few options there and uh, yeah Christoph saying like yeah reader adds the local function rather than ask which lets you remap um, the actual environment that you're reading within and stuff like that but for the most part we found ask and tell are kind of the two most useful parts of these if it turns out that reader is would be more useful then you know we'll add the full thing but yeah so in those examples would you be able to like set that up when you set up your root component for example um with the run ui and you could like um go get some configuration data from some server before starting up and then be able to access that in any of the components yeah exactly um or you know reading it from a config file or whatever it is but yeah you can do some stuff there that you could then set up a reader that you that you can then use throughout the app so you don't have to constantly you know i mean obviously it's like a kind of global but um unless you put refs in it or something at least it's a read-only glo global so it's the kind of thing that you know generally it's whatever you would ever use a reader for but it can be there are cases where it can be useful uh, we use it intelligent uh, in slam data quite a bit um but currently we have to lift before we ask whereas now you can just ask directly when you're in an eval which should be quite pleasant um, it might also be nice because you can reuse lenses that are defined like lens combinators that are defined in terms of monad ask or stuff, i guess yeah yeah um so basically it's just giving us more options by making halogen m into a real monad instead of being the free um we've you know got a whole new toolkit of things that, that it's going to give us the capabilities of uh, expressing so it'd be interesting to see how this stuff gets used and whether there's more options we have in here but yeah um and i guess the other thing i was going to mention was like i mentioned uh, earlier that we might have some benefit from using components that um, are not immediately obvious so normally in a virtual DOM type system no matter how many components you've got or whatever, if you change your child component somewhere, it means that the parent needs to be re-rendered and the parent's parent and so on and so forth, at least in the virtual DOM, because, and then you would then patch that against whatever you've got written. And it would only still end up actually changing the actual DOM for the, for the leaf that was modified. But with um, Halogen's components, each component is actually like a self-contained virtual DOM. So when you do something that manipulates the state of a component, it will only actually end up re-rendering the VDOM for that component and then it just patches it from the point that that component was attached uh, in the actual DOM. So it means, hopefully, you know, we should be getting some pretty nice speed advantages over probably just about any other virtual DOM system because as far as I know, they all end up redoing the whole tree. Whereas uh, now, you know, we, we only ever have to re-render just a specific so like incremental DOM. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know a little bit about incremental DOM, but I didn't think it had the ability to quite do what we're talking about. But yeah, maybe it is. I'm not sure. I've, you know, never really looked into too much uh, about how the actual, you know, what the implications are for how it, how it works. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's, it means basically if you do split up your app into lots of MIDI components, it means that there will be even less rendering and diffing going on. So having components is kind of a performance benefit in a lot of cases, um, whereas previously that isn't always the case. In fact, we um, kind of implemented something that was like a cheap version of this in <laughs> Slam Data because we were having issues with when we got to something like, I don't know, 20 components deep, we needed to break out of the component hierarchy because we had this, we have a pretty complicated setup where you can have things nested inside other things that have you know really deep hierarchies and so on so we kind of had a thing where where we essentially run another halogen inside a component um, 
but now we sort of integrated that into the part of the halogen itself so that whenever you have a, a you know a new component essentially each one is its own mini halogen you know universe so it's, it's uh, worth noting with that as well like we we saw something it was something ridiculous like a, a 50 times increase in performance for 100 yeah, and that was just increasing performance. In one case where you know we had this nesting thing but now hmm. each component itself is going to have this the effect is multiplied so you know so basically if you render a grid of like 10,000 buttons and you press one button it'll only ever adjust the, it'll only ever re render the virtual dom and the dom for the button itself that was clicked whereas previously it would have to re-render the virtual DOM at least for the the whole grid whenever you clicked it. So that was one of the kind of stress tests that we originally, well, someone pointed out. It was like <laughs> halogen behaves terribly in this case. So we found some workarounds for it. But um, yeah, now it's you know additionally going to be even better because the the the, the case is avoided where that would even be a, a thing in the first place. And I'm pretty sure no none of the other systems do that yet. But yeah, I guess we'll have to look a bit more into incremental DOM and figure out whether that's the thing. Um, it's yeah. worth noting as well that like um, Slam Data is like basically a visual programming environment for analytics that allows you to build analytic applications like using this graphical interface. So it's incredibly like it's far more complicated than anything I've ever worked on. It's got far more like discrete moving parts than anything I've ever worked on. So even previously, you probably wouldn't have seen these performance issues quite as bad as um, as 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 um, you would expect. But um, even now, since we've done that, and now with the new halogen as well, um, the performance is going to be extremely good, um, even for incredibly complicated and deeply nested um, applications. Yeah, and so even if the new virtual DOM driver that's pure script based turns out to be not quite as fast as some of these alternatives, that might not actually matter because of the, um, well, I mean, obviously it matters, but what I mean is that might be mitigated somewhat by the fact that the components themselves will also be incremental. Um, so I think it's going to be quite practical to use that instead of having to resort to one of the other drivers, perhaps if we need, you know, because SnapDOM is the other driver a lot of people have been asking about. Um, because it's, you know, obviously Cycle uses it and it's kind of like the new virtual DOM basically and it's significantly faster. Um, but uh, hopefully people won't actually ever get to the point where that would become a necessity anyway and just because um, the diffing, the, the extra incremental layering will, uh, you know, kind of help with it. Um, Alex was asking another question here about component local CSS is outside of the scope of allergens responsibilities. Um, yeah, basically. I mean, it definitely would be something I'd like to look at because, uh, you know, and if any time you can component up a, U, a UI, it's definitely going to be helpful. But um, we haven't really looked into that yet or kind of come up with anything for it. And I don't think you would have to necessarily make it, uh, you know, halogen specific. We, we could probably come up with some solution generally that would work with that. But, um, you know, there's definitely something that would be interested in exploring. So, yeah. With uh, component local state, does that mean it's now a lot easier to make uh, reusable halogen components? Yes. Yeah. Like, is there something like a canvas component or something where you can, like, is that possible to build? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we you could pre you could always do that in the past because this halogen has always had the kind of private state thing, or at least since like version 0.5 or something. But um, the uh, the the change to sort of reveal no details about the, the inner detail, you know, the, the children of the component means it's going to be significantly easier to make uh, reusable components and um, sort of like meta components, you know, components that have, that will accept other components and so forth. So you could have a more you know, sort of like a general purpose list that deals with, you know, drag and drop and stuff like that. And then you could only, you could provide like the, um, the item component to it because they could share a sort of, query algebra that is like common to <coughs> things you would want as items in a list and stuff like that. So there's a lot more scope for um, kind of coming up with more like an ecosystem of components or, you know, like libraries of components and stuff like that, now, which was always sort of the goal. But um, until you truly hide the sort of implementation details of a component through the, you know, uh, obscuring the sort of child details, I think that was always less practical um, than it is now. So, yeah interesting to see what comes out of that.
So anyone else, any questions or anything? Or, uh... Okay, right, folks type in a link. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I would say, I mean, for those people who probably this might have been a bit uh, incoherent, then at least um, the new guide that will be going up very shortly, honest, um, will have a much more methodical sort of introduction to the components and uh, to the to the concepts and sort of explain things in a <laughs> in a more sensible uh, manner. Uh, so um, over time, I hope to add lots more stuff to it, so, so it kind of covers a lot more of the advanced use cases and things that aren't. Um, that aren't currently sort of talked about in the in the current guide, but um, what's going to go up when it for the, like the initial release uh, will just be sort of covering everything up to the point of being able to have like you know hierarchies of nested components and so forth. Okay, so right fold. So my experience with halogen is that it's easier to define components and have them interact than say Elmer plugs because the state is private. Yeah, exactly. I mean um, that is definitely a big factor of why we sort of wanted to do this. Uh, the um, Currently, like, like the previous versions have been sort of getting better at that at each point, but now we've made the stuff fully private. It's um, definitely more, you know, more, um, although it's obscuring more and like encapsulating more stuff, it actually makes it more reusable <laughs> and more approachable because you don't have to um, deal with a lot of this sort of in the details of these things and tidying the types means that they become more you know usable in more situations because you don't have to reveal as much about or make things compatible by checking that they they have the same thing um session replay um basically there is no story for that right now um it's not impossible because um we there is a piece of the halogen implementation called the driver um which is a slightly overloaded term but in, the, in our case it basically it means like how do we make an app out of some components um and we can within there there is um like the thing that handles the uh um what's the word like the well, basically the evaluation of uh, queries against the component. So we definitely have lots of options for what we can do here. This is the kind of thing that Becky was, has talked to me about as well, or like possibly how, how we can sort of enable stuff for debugging, but we could add hooks into the driver so that um, like every message that goes into a component is tracked and stored, serialized or whatever. So there's definitely some scope there for kind of enhancing a driver or creating a debug driver that lets you um, sort of do session tracking and possibly even have like a REPL for doing stuff. Um, but that's not something that we've, you know, kind of been working on. I'm just trying to get the thing working first. Um, the, but once it is, we will be. <laughs> Becky will be. I will be. <laughs> um, but the, uh, um, that was previously impossible because a lot of the, the kind of, um, the architecture of the app was kind of, tied up within the actual implementation of components but now components are like really dumb they're just essentially a collection of functions and uh, values so the driver is essentially responsible for all the work of how to piece the things together how to run queries against them how to do everything so um, we can do all kinds of things in the driver that will enable us to um, you know track that information and expose it and possibly make it interactive if in the REPL thing yeah, so for example, if you have a component, you could view all of the queries which it um, has uh, received, as well as trigger any of the, of the queries which it um, can receive, um, which would then allow you to sort of see what would happen if, if, you, if, if you got into the situation without coming up with some um, uh, horrible one-off test uh, code. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Sorry, I was just reading uh, what Rightful's saying here. So the point is that uh, reacting to state changes reminds me a bit of imperative programming. I have to keep track of the order in which I change different parts of the state and stuff like subscribe to events at the correct time and update state in multiple places to keep it in sync. Whereas within uh, Alm and Pux, that would automatically happen because it's always propagated down in one direction. Yeah, it's definitely true. Um, I mean, the propagation down the way is something that is awkward in Halogen, uh, like compared to React or Elm or Pux or one of these. Because we don't have something like like React props, you actually have to always use a query to send information down into a child. There is possibly some stuff we can do with that. Like we could have props, um, something like props, where you just pass a map of values through or something like that. Um, but we, or even just a record with it, would need EQ at least as a as a constraint on it, so that we could actually detect when it changes, so that as it would probably need to be processed in the child like a query regardless. But it's um, you know, it's not, uh, it's kind of a trade-off that we are willing to pay given that the, the sort of, um, you know, the power that you get from the ability of being able to propagate changes both up and down the way by, you know, querying and so forth. Um, but yeah, looks like we're coming to the end of the time anyway. So um, I think unless anyone else has any questions, I'm ready to stop now anyway. Yeah, that the only the only other thing with that is you're completely right, right, fold. But the ability to use uh, third party libraries in the same way that you would in any other sort of um, app, web application development um, is is a huge boon. Not having to use something that um, is necessarily written in PS script or that you have to implement yourself um, is like it's really really useful. And um, what I've noticed as well is just in comparisons between, uh, I, you know, I, I, quite a few times I've quite set, set a sort of task, like me and me and Elm developer, like, oh, let's both write this thing and I can finish it. And I'm not the best developer. I can finish it in about uh, an hour, the, like some simple task, like make a bingo card generator or something like that. And it will take them a, a day or so to do the same in Elm. And that might just speak to our abilities as developers, I'm not sure. But um, from what I found, this the ecosystem of, um, of uh, peer script libraries um, is much more focused on application development as opposed to um, uh, examples and, and things like that and more theoretical things. Um, so um, I, I think that, that the ability, which is sort of, at the core of halogen's design to to uh, be able to use those libraries um in my own opinion and that's not necessarily the case for every single application or every single developer offsets those issues um and the sort of uh the way it makes it kind of slightly difficult to do more difficult to do that by sort of like making you say inherently oh this is raising this event on this or um this is going to query this component um, means that it's much harder to make those mistakes, even though it is possible. Yep, thanks for saying that, Becky. That's a pretty good, good way of putting it. And there are, there are a few of these components, right? Like Ace or Leaflet, you wouldn't want to rewrite the yeah, exactly. <laughs> app library. These things, you, sometimes you just need them, and then you kind of want to enter, have, have a way of using them. Uh, will you need, need for query, for children query co-products and parents? Okay, so co-products are still involved when you have children of different types, which is something I didn't get into at all in here, but um, we've kind of worked on it to make it a bit more, a bit simpler to deal with that stuff by um, introducing a bunch of new type synonyms and some actual type level operators that make it easier to uh, sort of, define those things. Um, that's actually part of the guide that I haven't got up to yet, so I don't really have a good way of explaining those like off the top of my head at the moment, but there's definitely some stuff in there that will help with that to remove a lot of the um, like difficulties that there previously were with working with that stuff. I mean, it's still there, but it, we've tried to improve that situation as well, basically. Yeah, dependent types to find the slot value. So I've looked at a few different things that like maybe parameterizing the slots by the actual child types and stuff like that, but I haven't really got a good way of doing it. We, we need at least GADTs to be able to do it.
but um, yeah, probably dependent types to be able to do it properly without cheating. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. So has anyone got anything for next um, time? Uh, I think that's what Alex was saying when I arrived, was it? That, um, the, uh, there isn't a, no one's volunteered yet, but. <laughs> So you can go ahead, Beck, if you've got something to talk about. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and it's I can unfortunate that the old Halligan presentation wasn't here. We didn't have it still because I think possibly I did a better job <laughs> of explaining things in a more cohesive manner. But um, yeah, like I say again, if anyone, like I'd recommend reading the guide if it, if any of that stuff wasn't clear or, or yeah, I mean, rewatch and so on. But hopefully there's a few more things in here that the guide didn't exactly, doesn't make obvious that may be interesting in the real world when you actually get using stuff or when you get a bit more involved, I guess. And yeah, thanks Becky for chiming in with uh, making some of the things I say more understandable. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, not really, I mean, no schedule for the other renderers, but um, the, I mean, anyone, w once we have the lead on stuff fixed, we'll actually be releasing this version of Halogen at least. So um, from that point on, you know, it would be great to <laughs> have anyone contribute any of that stuff if they want to have a stab at it. I have tried to abstract them. Actually, I'll just share my screen a sec again because um, the I've tried to make the renderer as um, easy to implement as possible for these different things, which is possibly like, you know, a pipe dream, but there is basically two functions you need to implement to implement a, um, a different driver. Um, as long as you're using, you know, AF and whatnot. So, uh, the best way of showing this. So, so most of the driver is basically going to be the same for every component because you're dealing with. Well, this assumes you're both dealing with running the running halogen in AF and also using HTML rendering. Um, but you know, essentially, to make a new driver, you have to implement these two functions. So they're pretty crazy because there's a lot of stuff going on in that, but the, at least it means that um, it should be relatively easy to add additional drivers because you only have to do these two parts and most of the hard work is taken care of already in like how to deal with the actual um, like communication between the driver and uh, components and all that kind of thing. So um, what this actually looks like when you implement it would be is probably more comprehensible than the actual type signature. So in the virtual DOM case, the render function is this. So what we have here is um, we need to produce some virtual DOM compatible vtree, which is what this render HTML stuff does. Um, the handler is like the, uh, the thing that processes queries for the current component we're in. Um, there's some other stuff in there that anyway, I won't go into too much, but essentially this, this function is, okay, is where we handle like if the if it was last rendered with nothing, it means we're initializing a new component. So we need to like, you know, create an element, append it to the DOM, so forth. And if the thing has already been created, then we all we need to do is patch it. So for a VDOM renderer, a virtual DOM, this is pretty straightforward. And we just have, um, wait a sec, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but um, the render child stuff is pretty straightforward as well, which is, this is relying on, uh, part of virtual DOM's sort of patching behavior to allow us to do the kind of incremental thing where we just throw a widget in there. Um, and the widget we've defined always returns the node that you've, but anyway, that's pretty specific implementation details. But then uh, for a comparison, the VDOM driver is not really much different than, you know, in terms of what we do in here. It's essentially a similar sort of thing. This is the PureScript um, virtual DOM version where we, you know, we construct the, some initial thing. Well, this is based on like a, a, um, a state machine, but the uh, patch process for um, the VDOM renderer rather than kind of the, it's done in one pass rather than two basically. But anyway, um, we need to construct the machine, then we, you know, make an initial state out of that, append the thing to the page. Uh, and then in the other case, we just 
update a machine by running the next step of it based on the VDOM. So, you know, in theory, it should be pretty easy to add additional um, like uh, drivers because all we need to do is figure out some way of making them fit into this model of like, you know, do something to initialize it, do something to sort of increment the rendering of the thing. The render child part is a little bit where it kind of gets a little trickier because in those situations we need to do, we need to insert something that will um, allow us to essentially take control of the patching process. So, um, because this is where this is where we do the incremental thing, and instead of rendering um, like the remainder of the DOM for the children, we actually want to just give us back the same load that the child was using already. So that's kind of how we do the the kind of fully incremental thing. But anyway, the point being, hopefully, we'll be able to kind of spin up a bunch of different drivers that that, that deal with this stuff. So I'll probably try and revive my React one not too long after. Um, uh, you know, releasing this stuff just because I'd be interested to see how well it actually, um, uh, you know, how suitable it's actually going to be. But the render function had the HTML hardwired in there, right? Uh, yes, this one does. Okay. Um, but yeah, so in the case you were talking about where you want to use this for something other than HTML rendering, the actual um, driver part of it will have to be reconsidered and dealt with somehow. Um, but that's not really a problem either because I also split the driver into two pieces, one of which is to do with evaluating queries and then the other part is essentially the rendering process. So again, you, there's probably an, another big chunk of reusable code in there. Um, it's only the stuff to do with rendering and like component initializers and stuff like that that would need to be re-implemented um, for the actual um, non HTML drivers. So yeah. sounds great. I might look at doing something with blessed or something. Yeah, I was going to say like curses or blessed or something. That would be awesome. I'd be interested to see. That would be pretty neat. Uh, blessed is like a terminal uh, UI generator things so you can like you know make menus and um uh, like virtual windows inside your terminal yeah it's the same as curses <laughs> um yeah and once halogen's we've done with this release and stuff hopefully i'll be able to start working on the compiler again because <laughs> this has been taking up a lot of my time for quite a long while now working on it on and off. Well, the documentation has taken me forever, like a ridiculous amount of time. But um, the, uh, um, yeah, hopefully I'll have some time to get into working on compiler features again soon. Yeah, I was I was thinking about a, like an a, a adventure game. <laughs> like, I'm trying to think how it would fit in, like would like the different rooms be components or what? Like. <laughs> They build up a map of like this town has these like well, I guess one component and the component um, is the thing that like you know has the choices then you can make well you might need a couple of different components different types of room or something like yeah 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 the first non um, HTML non UI or, or non visual you know non uh, yeah, well, basically non-browser UI um, halogen. I'll be pretty interested to see what, 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 if we can come up with something that's suitable and makes sense. <laughs> mm. Yeah, three. I mean, that would be awesome, but I have no idea what it would, <laughs> in reality, what that would mean. Um, like, it's quite a while since I've done anything with 3GS, though. So, I mean, these days it's probably moved on quite a bit from when I last looked at it. Yeah, for 3GS, I always just copy examples because I have no idea yeah. what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much going to head off soon as well. As well. So, um... Harry, what do you want to work on next in the compiler? Just curious because you said you were going to work on it. I kind of want to get back into working on the core imperative stuff. Oh, um, heard. Nice. Yeah. Because and then once that's in there, there's a couple of optimizations that I'd like to add that 
um, currently, we, I mean, we could do them wherever, but I would like to, you know, well, for starters, I would want to move as much of the optimizer into the core imperative instead of operating on the JavaScript. And then um, there's a few things I want to do, like um, moving the type class uh, instances further up the, the scope so that they're not you know, reevaluated repeatedly and stuff like that. And I think those things will be easier to do. I could probably do that on core functional actually even, but anyway, yeah, there's a, there's a, I don't know. I haven't really got anything specific in mind. I just want to get back into it. <laughs> I checked a few, you have a PR of that open, right? Oh, that, that's actually yeah. something else. That's just about the code generation for, um, yeah, that would actually make things a lot um, simpler. Uh, like in terms of the, we can basically delete a bunch of things out of the AST if I get that working. But there's some problem in the type checker that means that <laughs> it's very bizarre, but basically the code desugars into something that works if you write it in the browser, but if, uh, sorry, in the, in yourself, because the desugaring process like makes it into a different, changes the representation. But if you write the AST for what you actually wrote, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, like basically if you write a simple Lambda um, it gets turned into a case, but if you try and write the, if you put insert the lambda as the AST equivalent for that lambda, then it doesn't type check correctly in the case that I have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, it so made me laugh, but it's yeah. I I feel it's basically the, there's some problem where the for all is too far down the type. Like it could be hoisted further up um, because it it can be floated to the left most of the type, but because of the way that the inference runs, I think it happened anyway. I don't know. It means that we end up with a situation where there's a um, constrained type error, as in, you know, mm -hmm. kind of unify constrained type with blah, 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 when you do it one way and not the other. So, yeah, because you know, the optimization still happens on the typed AST. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, just a few yeah. things I can look at anyway. Yeah, I did, I did play around with uh, LLVM again, wrote a little, <laughs> like, little compiler for, uh, or, like, code generator for. Uh, I think it's simply type lambda calculus with lead bindings. Nice. Or something. Uh, I mean, I went off Stephen Deal's tutorials and added a few things. All right. Yeah, yeah. The, the super fun. Yeah. script actually, or maybe just the subset of pure script. Just leave out. Just, just like don't do type classes for now, and then <laughs> see how far I can get. Yeah, yeah. Just make a new language and then be like, yeah, this one's implemented in pure script, it's, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I just mentioned, uh, Claudia, I think I mentioned that as just a joke mainly, but um, I, it would be pretty cool to, to try it because I don't know anything about Rust, so I'd like to do it just as a, as a learning exercise. Um, I think people would really know, appreciate it. Because okay. I think people would really appreciate it because a lot of people like go into doing Rust thinking, oh, cool, I can do Haskell at Z speeds. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out, no, you can't. Um, and you wouldn't really be able to with the pure script to Rust compiler either because there would be an overhead to that. But it would mean that you would be able to generate Rust um, with, uh, using something that is a lot like, more like Haskell. <laughs> yeah. I think Rust is really hard as a compiled target though, because you yeah. need to like borrow make the borrow checker happy, exactly. I think that's kind of hard with generated code. But. <laughs> yeah, it might be useful though, because I guess at least then it would be helpful for other targets, like for things that are memory, you know, that, that don't have, um, well, not, you know, that are non-garbage collected, that have some, I mean, I guess, like Andy's on here at the moment. Do you do we use like automatic reference counting or something in the in Pure Eleven? How how does it actually deal with that? At the use the C plus plus built in reference counter, or you can yeah. link against the uh, upper GC. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I basically know nothing about modern C plus plus. So. <laughs> <laughs> me, me neither. But I read about I read up on these things. Yeah. Yeah. But it's worth remembering as well that you can just use Node.js just for the browser. Well, uh, thanks a lot. That was great. Uh, no it was really good. Mostly made sense. Absolutely. Lots of good ideas as well. Yeah, 
So I think it's always more fun kind of to have a, or sometimes it's more fun to have a chat about these things rather than just sort of try and do a presentation that's, you know, straight up is the thing. But at the same time, probably it's hard to learn from <laughs> a rambling conversation about the thing. So, but I mean, that's why I say, that I think that the guide should do the, the, the main job about, you know, doing that kind of thing with people who actually want to pick it up and start using it. But um, yeah. Great, I'll be off then. Yeah, cool. Awesome. You too, Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot.